You good? Next one's another short one. Hi, Dr. Rand. I love your show. Thanks. Do you feel that it's... Not, by the way, uh, I'm sure they're talking about our show. <laughs> You're the star. <laughs> no. <laughs> this is all your idea. You know it. So anyway, do you feel that it's necessary to give blood regularly to lower red blood cells when on anabolic steroids? No. Oh. Let that sink in. This drives me nuts. <laughs> You'll probably have to edit this one big time. So... Um, <laughs> This goes back to a, a discussion, an, an argument, whatever you want to call it, about blood viscosity versus blood stickiness and their correlation, if that. Um, blood viscosity is not the same thing as blood stickiness. And that's what this is typically all about. Lowering red blood cells, which is really not what we're trying to do. What, what we're trying to do is bloodlet, do what we call a therapeutic phlebotomy to reduce the thickness, the viscosity of the blood, thinking that that is going to reduce the risk of clotting, a stroke, okay? It just doesn't happen that way. Yes, through something called uh, Virchow's triad, you know, this goes back to physics and stuff that I hate to get into because it's going to just turn people off, but the basic premise is the, the way I use it, uh, explain it, which has nothing to do with um, the, the uh, details of the physics, is just think of it as like the stickiness. You have these two magnets with opposite poles, right? And if I take them and I go like this, right, back and forth, I'm not going to feel much attraction to, between the two, right? But if I slowly do that, if it's a strong enough magnet, I might not even be able to stop it from sticking together. That's where blood viscosity is related to stickiness, okay, which is kind of more of a, um, a colloquial term for, you know, medically this, this um, intrinsic property of sticking together. And there's different types of this that have to do with like a factor five Leiden uh, gene mutation, which makes your blood more likely to stick together, okay. But it's a different concept than, than, than thickness, okay. But you can see if things, because the blood is thick, okay, and you have more resistance along the, the, the vasculature, for example, it slows down, and to use that matting example, you have a greater ability to stick together. Now, that said, though, you go, okay, well, yeah, see, that's, what they're, that's really what they're talking about, but that's their point. Well, the body makes changes to compensate for that. Well, how do you know that? Well... Think about people that live at elevation, right? Aspen. We have an office there, and we have a lot of people, males I'll start with, that have a hemoglobin, okay, of 19.6, let's say, and a hematocrit, which is reflective of red blood cells, of, you know, uh, three times that. That would be like, you know, 57, 58%. Wow. Well, how come they're not stroking out? How come everyone who doesn't, you know, who lives at 6,000 feet or above, Aspen is, you know, 8,800, something like that, or maybe that's mammoth. But anyway, isn't uh, you know, clotting left and right? Because the body compensates, particularly, and this is important, when it's done gradually or you're born there or whatever and you compensate from the moment you're born or the moment you get there and your body says, well, the oxygen is thin here, so we got to make more oxygen carrying capacity. That's those red blood cells and the hemoglobin and the hematocrit. And so the blood gets thicker, but then your body compensates. It makes more plasma, part of the blood that increases the volume so that you have relatively less viscosity, right? And there's other things it does to control some of the chemicals in the blood that make it less likely to clot. So it compensates, in other words. Now, this gets into, and this because this is what we talk about, I'm going to uh, go beyond, well, no, anabolic steroids, but testosterone too. Most of my patients are, we're talking about just TRT. But this is important because I think a lot of people are talking about testosterone replacement therapy, not just anabolic steroids, mm -hmm. right? So we have some studies, too, that I'm aware of, and it really boils down to this, to, be, to, to, not, to try not to be so long-winded. 60 to 90 days, depending upon which study, when you first start TRT, or in this case could be an anabolic steroid, which ha should have an even greater effect on these, these numbers, your risk goes up. Why? It returns to normal, by the way. It goes up slightly. By the way, goes up slightly if, this is a big if, I should have said this up front, 
if you have a predisposition like a factor V Leiden or something else which is referred to as a coagulopathy, a, a defective mechanism that makes your blood more likely to stick together to begin with, those people have a slightly increased risk when they go on TRT for either 60 or 90 days. And why is that? It goes back to what I was referring to earlier. The body doesn't have enough time to adjust, make those adjustments as though as it does when you live at altitude, which by the way, just think about that for a second. I kind of went right by that. We, we don't see people dropping dead at elevation that have typically way higher hemoglobin, hematocrit, and red blood cell count that people have a cow about here at sea level, right? Because the body compensates. When you go on TRT and you have this predisposition, for a brief period, you have a slightly increase, increased risk of having this happen. That returns to normal after that period. Okay, so actually I did that pretty quickly, much quicker than I thought I was going to be able to. Because <laughs> it happens a lot in discussion, even with some hematologists that are supposed to know better, the people who study blood and, and know all these, these factors and get into, you know, a virtual triad and the things that I don't want to get into, the technical stuff about, you know, hypercoagulability and, and uh, you know, the, the, um, the, 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 the you know, I said I wasn't going to do it, but the resistance against the, the, the walls of the vasculature, et cetera. So do you have to do so? No. However, is it a good idea sometimes? Yes. Why? Not to lower the, um, well, and again, for the average person, if this person has this coagulopathy, then yeah, they're at slightly greater risk and you go, wait, let's, let's not do this. Why would you want to increase your risk? So you could test for these various uh, coagulopathies before you even did an anabolic steroid cycle to make sure that you're not at increased risk, slightly increased risk. Um, otherwise, you should be safe and not worry about it uh, for the reasons I explained, hopefully, that make it clear that you don't have to worry about thicker blood necessarily. But um, some people, when their blood viscosity uh, rises like that, and I found that as it relates to hemoglobin, 18.5 grams per deciliter tends to be where uh, patients, and this is for a male, sorry, uh, for females, I think we're talking closer to 16.5, but the, the individual will say, yeah, you know, I get up from a chair and I feel maybe a little dizzy sometimes for a beat or two, like you would if you were dehydrated, like you were if you're in low blood sugar. Because the viscosity makes it a little more difficult for the blood to come up to the head from the legs when you stand up. So it's a couple seconds of, whoa, okay. Some people, you might get to 19.5 at sea level and they go, okay, I just don't feel right. I feel dizzy all the time, not just when I get up out of a chair. Well, that's a good reason to go ahead and do what we call a therapeutic phlebotomy. Maybe you could donate the blood to someone who could use it, but for you, you need to get rid of it. Why? Because it's not helping you feel good or function well, right? So that's a good reason. But otherwise, I'm not a big fan of donating it because you're putting more stress on your body to make more. Your, your body's going to say, Okay, great. Now I got to work harder again, make more red blood cells. There's a reason why it did that to begin with. Mm. Whether it's the anabolic steroids or a combination, typically, they have sleep apnea and then the anabolic steroids are leveraging your body's reaction to that, saying, okay, if you're not going to breathe at night in bed while you're sleeping, then, you know, because you're, 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 you know, sawing logs so much and your oxygen saturation is dropping, then we're going to have to make more oxygen carrying capacity. Well, the anabolic steroids are going to leverage that effect even more. So you see that elevation. Anyway, that's going to continue, and you're digging into your stem store, stem cell stores in your blood, uh, your your bone marrow, right? Well, you don't really want to do that. Why do you want to do that? And 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 this goes into another kind of a sensitive topic. Sorry, I'm going off on a tangent, but for those um, well um, intentioned people that donate blood, which is absolutely necessary for our blood banks and for other people's health, and is a great idea. Be judicious in that because you're doing a great service to other people, but you, you know, if you do it too frequently, you might be taxing your ability to make red blood cells for yourself as you get older. So there's, you know, there's a reason to control this by not overdoing anabolic steroids or not doing them at all if you don't need them. And for adjusting for the, you know, if you've got sleep apnea, because your body's going to keep reacting that way. And especially if you need to donate blood to feel better. Okay. It's, 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 it's hitting you on the back end, possibly.
Does that make sense mm -hmm. about the bone marrow? So that was a really short question. I gave a really long answer to it. <laughs> but, but I hope that that makes sense because I can't tell you how many times I have to address this because the patient sees it and reads something about it or you know, another physician, again, rarely a hematologist, but even hematologists have said this, uh, or, you know, I've actually heard it from two hematologists directly, but others, you know, by a, by a patient that, oh yeah, you know, that means you're gonna stroke out. No, it, no, it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean you ignore it and you may need to address it, but don't just willy nilly go and say, oh yeah, it's a problem, I'm gonna stroke out and I go, go donate, donate blood. Good question. Thanks, Doc. So we have another guest question. <laughs> Jen, you were talking about at, uh, at lunch about uh, the difference between different lab assays of testosterone. Go ahead and ask the question you asked me. So my question is, when you go to get labs done and you get a reading from one lab uh, quest to like a lab corp, why are their numbers totally different? And how can you compare it if they aren't even in the same realm? Great question. And you're not going to like the answer when I tell it to everyone else like I told you at lunch. So, without naming names, I mean, you named a couple labs. I'm not going to say which is which. The listener can do his or her research on his or her own. But this is mind-boggling to most people, I'm sure, to know that testosterone levels, total testosterone should be measured typically, I shouldn't say should, but are typically measured in nanograms per deciliter. And in the two that you mentioned, that's the case. Testosterone for a male is typically about 2%, when I'm talking about testosterone, free testosterone, as a percentage of total, should be about 2%. Okay, it can vary, but that's the average, okay? Now, some labs will list it that way. And you go, okay, yeah, that's about 2% of the total. And they, uh, the units of measurement are typically picograms per milliliter. Other labs, it will be reflected as 20%, meaning the decimal point is off by one full, you know, uh, uh, what did I say, move to the uh, right. And um, it still says picograms per milliliter. Mind boggling, right? And this has been going on for a long time. And yes, it's very confusing to patients because they go, my God, when I first came in, doc, you know, my, this is a male again, my free T was, you know, 4.2, you know, top end for a female, if you're using LabCorp, for example. And then, uh, and then we, you know, we got on T and, you know, when it peaked at, you know, two and a half days after my injection, it was 30.1 picograms per milliliter. And then I went to this other lab because that's what my insurance covered. And it says it's, you know, 310. <laughs> What's going on? I'm overdosing. I swear it was just one cc. Well, no, that was one. It was exactly the same, actually, in the example I just gave accidentally. Uh, it was one decimal point wrong. And I have called various labs and asked about this. And there were many jokes made, but it's fascinating to me that we can still have this amount of error extant in this business of helping people. And it just really goes to show, and I'm going to be a little bit negative here, how, you know, how little attention this, we'll call it field, this area of medicine gets when you can have these assays presented like that. And from what I heard, and, you know, this is a decade ago, uh, when I first asked, and I don't know if it's changed or not, but certainly there are these, because this happened to you recently, there are still these labs that are producing this misinformation, we'll call it, wrong information. Um, you know, I, I was one of the few that even noticed, and I'm not giving myself the pad. It's just, you know, it's mind-boggling that, you know, this is, this is a laboratory result, and we're dealing with people's lives here, and you're off by a full decimal point. So, uh, obviously, kind of a pet peeve of mine. Um, your, your question was, uh, I guess, you know, how does a patient deal with this? Well, know that... Um, don't go there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And again, let's not name, name labs because we don't want to get in trouble. But you can use your own um, math skills and say, well, is this roughly 2%? Then that's probably fairly accurate. It ain't going to be anywhere close to 20% free T to total T. If it's in, you know, picograms per milliliter of free versus nanograms per deciliter total. So... That's all I can tell you and, and warn you, but hopefully make you feel better knowing that, yeah, oh, that, that's not as crazy as I thought. Uh, your dosing, in other words, isn't going like that. 
um, or your, your body's reaction to it, it's, it's just the laboratory error. All right, good to know. No mercy for you, no worries for you. That Game of Thrones, go sexy on you. I flipped the script, I rolled the dice. Don't fall asleep, cause I'm working nights. Hey, you trying to show.